Okay, good morning everybody. Today it's Pablo Pacheco who is going to talk to us about uh, deforestation in the Amazon and probably uh, answer all the questions you, alwa you always wanted to know but never dared to ask about this. And he's going to present the results of analysis at the sub-municipality level and he will explain us what is a sub-municipality level because it's not clear and, and show us what, what, have been the, what has been the trend since the last 15 years in terms of deforestation. Yeah. No, Pablo. Was. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Well, what I wanted is to share with you the findings, data, and some of the discussion of a paper that has been published uh, last week in the Panas Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. A paper that was led by colleagues from the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, Javier Godard and uh, Toby Gardner. And the main goal of that paper is to understand. Uh, who, what has been the contribution of the different actors, and by actors I, I mean smallholders, medium-scale uh, landholders, and large-scale landholders, to the deforestation slowdown. And by understanding the contribution of these actors to the deforestation slowdown, then we can understand also what could be the potential implications for the new increase of deforestation in the Amazon. And we think that this debate is important because, as you know, in the tropics there is still a lot of discussion about how is that possible to reconcile uh, agricultural production expansion but without putting much more additional pressure on forests? So this is a very relevant debate. It's a debate that is also very relevant for the Brazilian Amazon who are, who are also struggling with the fact of having to reduce deforestation but at the same time promoting the expansion of, of beef and soy but in the context of the commitments to reduction of deforestation because of the targets that they set by themselves as part of the uh, climate change agenda. So, and also I think it's important to have this discussion about the different ways in which different actors contribute to deforestation or to reduce deforestation because as we know, uh, actors respond in different ways to policies and markets. So we cannot just keep saying uh, or talking about general trends of deforestation reduction in the Amazon without understanding what are the specific contributions of these different actors. And this may help us even to uh, think about what can we uh, continue doing in terms of decreasing these deforestation rates you know, by understanding how the different actors may be uh, responding to these policies and markets. So what's the main uh, conclusion of this, of this paper that I'm discussing now? Well, uh, the data that I'm going to share with you uh, suggest that uh, the policies that have been focusing too much on command and control, uh, they have targeted large, large properties and the main uh, hotspots of deforestation hotspots. But this is reaching the limits. So I think uh, we are suggesting that uh, if we want to see a further uh, reduction of deforestation in the Amazon, probably the approach has to change you know, from this command and control to a bit more uh, incentive-based conservation approaches. So that's, that's the main uh, 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 case that we are making in the paper. And then I will discuss a bit in detail the findings. But for the ones that are not uh, familiar with the Amazon, I will share some basic data. You know, the Amazon is a Huge area, it's very diverse, it's five million uh, square kilometers, so it's a, it's a large area. And around 20% of the original forest cover in this region has already been deforested. No? And the main drivers, as probably you know, have been the expansion of cattle ranching, about 70% of deforestation in the Amazon is because of pasture expansion and then soy. No? So those, those are the major drivers of deforestation. And the major peak of deforestation in the Amazon was 2004 when uh, the annual rate was around 27,000 uh, square kilometers. No? But then since 2004, uh, deforestation has been slowing down to a very uh, important ways, no? until reaching five, seven uh, thousand square kilometers. And it has more or less stabilized, no? five and seven thousand square kilometers in the last years. Even though is, is increasing a little bit. So there was a dramatic reduction of deforestation. And our paper is trying to understand so who were the actors that contributed to this reduction. And, and as probably you already know, uh, there have been a combination of, of policies, private initiatives, and market conditions that helped to explain that, that reduction, which I'm not going to discuss. Uh, 
And in 2013, and probably this year, deforestation is increasing a little bit. No? In 2013, increased 28% respect to 2012, but still in the absolute terms of the, 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 the magnitude is not quite high, no? because as I was saying, it's, it's tending to stabilize. No? And, but what's important is that the Brazilian government, they made this uh, commitment that they wanted to reduce 80% the deforestation by 2020 with regards to the baseline of 2000 or 1996, 2005. So which is that actually they, they should be able, or they have committed to reduce deforestation to 3,800 uh, square kilometers. So there's still a way to go to achieve that target. And I think that's what is a, a bit worrying. So, so the paper is trying to quantify you know, the contribution of factors to total deforestation in the period 2004-2011. Uh, in absolute terms, the relative contributions and how that means has been shifting over time, but also what are the differences in terms of uh, forest fragmentation and degradation. You know? uh, so we are not just looking at deforestation, but also looking at forest uh, fragmentation. And the method that we have been used and that Robert referred to is that we are not looking at municipal, municipality level, but we are looking one level uh, below, which is the census tract level. For the ones who are not familiar with the census tract, is the, is, are the units in which the data for the agricultural census is collected. No? So we have around 700 municipalities in the Amazon, but when looking at the census tract, we can uh, conduct our analysis on around 13,000 census tracts. So that gives you much more detail about the tenure composition at this census tract level. So we were using that, that level. And what uh, we have done is we have linked the agricultural census data at the census tract level with remote sensing data coming from, uh, from INPE, you know, from, from PRODES. So by linking these two, uh, we have uh, come up with the concept of the actor dominance. So we were looking at who is the actor who is dominant in controlling the land at the census tract level. And we set up a threshold of 50%. So actors who dominate in the census tract level, uh, or they control more than 50% of that land, so we allocated that census tract to that specific actor. So we are working with four different actors, no small, medium, large, and very large, no, with the uh, specific thresholds. Um, and then based on that information, because I think, and, and probably and we may be right to say that this is quite difficult to differentiate the actors and you know, the contribution of actors because uh, the fact that is uh, the, the level of aggregation of the data. So we know that this method still may have problems you know, because of the threshold and because we are just looking at the actor dominance, but probably it's the only way in which we can get detail uh, understanding about the actor's contribution to deforestation. So what we found when we look at this data and the forest cover and deforestation trends, mainly is that there's very large skew land distribution in the Amazon. No? So this important process of land concentration that has, has taken place in the last year, just for you to have an idea, 81% of small scale land holdings control only 13% of the total land in the Amazon. And is the 1% or very large-scale land holdings who control 44% of total land in the Amazon. So still, the, there's important land concentration in the Amazon. And what's interesting to notice is that much of the forest uh, in which there is information on, on tenure is, is on census tract that are dominated by, by smallholders. And forests are in, are in a better condition in areas that are dominated by smallholders. Uh, not surprisingly, much of the forest is uh, located in the more remote areas because also we identified some remote areas which are the areas in which there's no information from the agricultural census. So it's around 1.5 million in which there's no information, 3.5 million in which we can find information about land tenure and actor dominance. So, uh, but based on this analysis, I will mention just three main findings of, of the paper. The first one is that what I already mentioned, that the smallholder areas contain less fragmented and degraded forests than areas dominated by large-scale uh, landowners. And this is a bit counterintuitive 
because some arguments they tend to say that smallholders they put a lot of pressure on, on forests, which seems not to be the case based on the analysis that we did in the paper and also based on data from INPE on forest degradation. No? So we run some uh, landscape uh, indicators on this data and basically that's, that's what we found. The second finding is that uh, in the period from 2004 to 2011, even though this dramatic decrease in deforestation, uh, large-scale landholders, they contributed to about half of the total uh, deforestation. And smallholders, they contributed with 12% to total accumulated deforestation in that period, 2004-2011. And that a bit undermines the narrative saying that deforestation has been controlled on large-scale uh, landholders and the only ones to blame are smallholders, which doesn't seem to be the case. And the third finding, which is interesting as well, is that by looking at the relative uh, contribution of deforestation, things have been changed. And of course, large-scale and very large-scale landholders, they have been uh, decreasing their contribution to deforestation from 2000 to 2011 in, in around 63%, which is very dramatic, but at the same time, smallholders have been increasing their contribution to deforestation in, in about uh, 63%. So the contributions are changing over time, and yes, smallholders tend to contribute more to deforestation in the, in the, last, in the last years. No? So one important message, I think, from, from the paper is that uh, Reducing deforestation in the future is going to be much more challenging, not just because deforestation is getting uh, or is happening through much more smaller you know, uh, patches, is being located in remote areas, that means that it's going to be more expensive to control. But at the same time, if there's an increase of contribution of smallholders in deforestation, we don't see that there are socially and politically acceptable arguments to just reduce deforestation through these more punitive uh, mechanisms. So there has to be a bit of change in the, in the ways in which uh, controlling deforestation and promoting sustainable land use management has to be taken with, with the smallholders you know, if we want to uh, contribute to improve their living conditions. So I think that's, well, those are the messages that we wanted to transmit with, with the paper. And we hope we are contributing to that discussion in a, in a meaningful way. Okay, thank you, Pablo. <clears throat> now we have about 15 minutes for question discussion. So, and if you have a question, you stand up so that the camera can see you. No question? You're all asleep or? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Pablo. I'm, I understand that you weren't necessarily looking into explanations for this, but based on your extensive experience there, I'm wondering if you can maybe brainstorm a little bit. I mean, presumably it's the kind of uh, global drive and attention that's been put on large companies that have driven the changes in their behavior. But what kinds of factors do you see explaining the change in smallholder behavior over the last decade? That's a good question, but uh, I think it's hard to, to answer what factors change uh, behaviors of the smallholders because you have different types of smallholders as well in the Amazon. You, know, you have, I think, smallholders that are a bit less connected to markets and value chains and cities, and you have the other smallholders which are much more integrated to market value chains and the cities, and even they, part of the household is in the, in the rural area, part of the household is in the city. I think uh, the ones that have been more connected to markets and value chains, part of change on behavior comes to the uh, market signals. You know, that very much are prices or the price of inputs, et cetera, et cetera. You know. And also I think they somehow, they may be feeling the effect that some constraints have been put in the, in the value chains. For example, the beef value chains, that is only uh, buying uh, legal beef. No, that is maybe putting some constraints on these actors and they may be receiving no, uh, signals to change behaviors from that side. But also you have an important number of smallholders uh, which have been quite successful in adopting uh, or engaging with, with markets through dairy production and probably are the ones who are doing relatively well no, by linking with milk production into the market and, and, and also uh, I think they put less pressure on forests and they can get more from the land that they have 
but also you have smallholders that are a bit further into the frontier that is more difficult for them to make a living. And I don't see that there can be strong signals no, from markets going to uh, produce changes in their behaviors because I think they are just are trying to make a living from the scarce resources that they have. No. So it's, it's, it's a bit yeah, complicated. I'm sorry if I didn't. Other question, a, comments? I think Christine has. Yes, Christine. Thank you. I also thought it was terrifically interesting to have these data. Um, I, I was wondering, I had two questions. One was about um, whether any of this is really about shifting cultivation with people actually re-clearing places that had been cleared before that go back to forest and now are cleared again, you know? Um, that was my, and actually maybe you can answer that while I try to remember what my second question was at the time. <laughs> well, Christine, unfortunately we cannot answer that question because we are just looking at data from the, from the agricultural census and, and the impact data on deforestation. I think we, you can make the hypothesis that part of that deforestation that is a bit more on remote areas may be because of this shifting cultivation practices. And that's why the approach to reduce the deforestation has to change. But I think we, we would need to do field work in order to see and to test the, you know, the hypothesis if that's necessarily the case. Or because you may have also the other situation in which uh, ranchers with a bit more of, or landholders with a bit more of capital, they may be pushing some smallholders also to go further into the frontier as a way to, you know, uh, uh, justify occupation of those lands. So, and I think by looking at this data, it's still not, not clear what can be the dominant process and probably are the two that are taking place in these frontiers. You know? But I think there's need to, to collect data in the field to test all those, those hypotheses. Okay, I have my other question. <laughs> um, Luke Perry has written about migration from very remote areas. And I don't know when you say very remote whether you mean the same kind of very remote. And his, his data indicate that from very remote, well, you know, uh, 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 Miguel and I and a number of other people have talked about this multi-locality in areas that in any other place but the Amazon would be considered remote, but in the Amazon remote gets to be very remote. And so we say there's a lot of multi-locality, but he points out the people who are really like several days, you know, up some river, um, they're actually moving out um, mm -hmm. because, largely because of service and the need for services. And what follows them, he suggests, is sort of rampant deforestation, but not by, but by logging companies. So they leave and then these other guys come in, which is a bit different from your narrative. Is there any, is there something that, are we talking about different kinds of areas or is that, is his just more anecdotal where yours is capturing a much broader um, uh, yeah, sample? I think that probably are both things, no? I think we are talking a bit in different ways of remote areas. In our case, we have identified or classified as remote the areas in which there was no, uh, data collected from the census. So in theory are those areas which IBGA, you know, the, the agency of statistics in Brazil, they cannot reach or for different reasons or because there are no land holdings there or because they have problems to reach those areas, but there's no data. And in our case, remote areas, they comprise about 1.5 million. So it's a big area. But an important portion of those remote areas are already with the protected areas or can be indigenous lands, no? So I think by uh, coming to the analysis or the conclusions that you came, I, yeah, I think you need to draw on case studies, no? Because in our cases, what basically the data is saying that forests are in much better condition in remote areas have been highly intervened in areas where you have more ranching, basically, and there's more fragmentation of those areas. And, but also there are still lots of forests in areas with the smallholders, you know, which also makes a lot of sense, you know, because smallholders, they have more complex land use mosaics. You know, they don't tend to intervene heavily. But yeah, but probably there's, in that range, there's a lot of diversity as well. Thank you. Another question? 
Well, maybe I have one. I mean, it's, there, there has been a 190% increase in deforestation in August, September compared to last year. And I was discussing with David Kemovic. He said that's, that's at the margin, it seems, of large properties. Do you see something like a shift, a sort of a consolidation? Small property are bought over by big one, and uh, what you think is an increase in deforestation by a small order is, in fact, uh, an extension of the large order into the small order. Yeah, again, I think that's an idea of hypothesis that has to be tested. I think it's taking place. No? But also, uh, in the Amazon, there always has been land concentration and land fragmentation at the same time. No, I think the, what's tricky is to differentiate those processes, already process, ongoing processes of land concentration and, and fragmentation, versus these new processes that would be a bit related to land speculation. No, or concentrate land because it's driven by land speculations and you know that uh, there's going to be a much enforcement going into those areas. No, but when you look at the distribution of deforestation and the land use maps, and, and also what's coming from, from this data is that more deforestation is going to these remote areas no, or areas that are on the margins where there has been previous land occupation. No? So it's taking in those, in those places. And as I said, no, it's quite difficult to say now if that deforestation is being driven by smallholders, no, that they're just making a living or you have this push. No, from, from medium large scale landholders and trying to grab and concentrate that land into the future. And I think both cases are possible, but the magnitude to which they are happening and, and the regional diversity, I think, is something that requires specific analysis, I would say. No. Other questions, comments? Then I have another one, if nobody has one. Uh, we, we did something a bit similar in the Congo Basin, uh, but also looking at the presence of road, the presence of urban centers. Something. Do, do you see something like that in the sense that the deforestation pattern is not the same when you are close to a large urban center or when you are close to a road than when you are being... Do you have this... I haven't read the, the NAS paper, but do you have this analysis using other covariable? No, I think that's an interesting analysis to do is look, to look at some causality. We, in this paper, we are just looking at the contribution of the different actors. I think an important analysis is to start putting in place some correlations to see causality. No, but that analysis has been done already in the past in the Amazon, and we know a lot about those correlations. No, and I don't see how much that would add no, in terms of... Uh, Land holdings that are close to markets, close to roads, they differ more than land holdings that don't share those characteristics. No, I think that's known in the, in the Amazon. Um, I think what would be interesting to do is to explore more about where the new deforestation hotspots may be taking place and to what extent that is being driven by these new commitments in the Amazon to expand the infrastructure. No, basically dams and the roads to the ports because there are investments in place and I think that is maybe uh, driven some of these speculative behaviors of landholders trying to grab the lands which are closer to where investments are taking place and I think that is going to be an important process that will take place into the future. Okay, yes, Christine. One good question. Do you know where there's reforestation going on? Have you looked at where forests are growing and what characterizes those areas yeah, in the this, Amazon? Yeah, this is a good question. We have not explored specifically in, in this paper where deforestation or reforestation is, is taking place, but we have data from INPE as well, no? the, the class, Terra class. No? Uh, Data that also identifies reforestation now. No? So for, some, for the last five years, we are able to look at where reforestation is taking place. And, and it is it's taking place in, in areas where you have more smallholders as well, no? I would say, because of this complexity of the, of the land use mosaics. No? OK, we can have one last question, comment. Yes, Will.
distinguished visitor from Japan. Just, just a, uh, uh, a small question. You mentioned that the uh, deforestation has gone down, but the contribution of smallholders has increased. Does that mean that absolutely that uh, deforestation has increased, or is, is, is it only percentage-wise and the, the, the area has sort of remained the same? Yeah, because when you look at the data, the, the reduction has been dramatic, you know, from 27,000 square kilometers to five. No, so the, now you are talking about from five to seven thousand square kilometers per year. In absolute terms, the contribution of smallholders has decreased as well, no, as as in the same, well, which is the same trend across all the different actors. But you have a different composition in the in the relative contribution of actors. No? So large scale and very large scale are contributing contributing less over time to total deforestation and the contribution of smallholders is increasing. Okay, thanks. Okay, then it's almost time. Uh, that's the end of this Science at 10, and uh, let's thank again Pablo, and thank you, uh, see you next Tuesday. <laughs>